Today, I'd like to introduce uh, a dear brother, Dr. Mo Awad, a neurosurgeon who does brain surgery and complex spine surgery. Mashallah, a leader in his field who works at the Melbourne Hospital and a few other hospitals as well. Mashallah, uh, does uh, amazing surgery and also has done two surgeries on me. <laughs> One of them just now. <laughs> <laughs> Welcome to uh, the Safi Bros podcast. Thank uh, you very much. Thank you for having me. Welcoming oh, to the uh, our podcast, which is again about success stories. And inshallah, this is your podcast and your success story throughout your journey. You know, as a Muslim youth, all the way through to where you are today. Inshallah, would love for you to share um, some of your journeys across uh, the time that you've been in Australia, abroad, and all the stuff that you've done. Inshallah, which we've I had the pleasure to chat to you about. Thank you. Welcome. Thank you very much. I know, like I say, it's a pleasure to be here. Um, I'm grateful to be here. Uh, firstly, grateful to Allah, of course, yeah, for everything that's happened, Alhamdulillah. Uh, the journey I've had. Um, and thank you guys for inviting me to share that story. Yeah, I mean, uh, I guess uh, I should start by saying, where do you want me to start? <laughs> okay, let, I think let's start as, um, I think we have a lot of youth out there at the moment uh, that are trying to find their feet and trying to find, to find that sort of... Yes. Calling. The calling, where am I going to do, how am I going to... Did you know at seven years of age you're going to be a neurosurgeon? Of course not, no. So take us through a journey. When did you find out that you were going to become a neurosurgeon or a doctor or even something of that equivalent? Did, did that, was it something that you had a focus at a younger age or something that you just started finding your feet as you progressed? I think I think the truth is, is that you know, uh, as Muslims, we believe that Allah guides you. But to some degree, you have to guide yourself to, you have to have a passion, you have to have um, what in the UK we like to term as oomph. You know, you've got to have that, mm. that drive to want to do something, um, sitting at home and saying, uh, you know, Allah's going to make me into uh, a rocket scientist uh, while I'm sat in my chair doing nothing. is not going to happen, of course. Of course. So for me, um, and I wasn't the most religious child. I grew up in a very religious household. My father's quite religious, alhamdulillah. My mother was. Uh, and, you know, we all believe in Allah and none of us did anything majorly wrong. But I wasn't the most religious boy. You know, I went through stages when I was a young man where you sometimes you prayed and sometimes you don't. Like all seven, eight, nine, ten year olds, we're all, you know, we've all been through that journey. Um, but I always believed in God. Even as a young kid, I always had that deep faith in Allah. Always. Allah. But I just didn't practice it as much. I was your typical boy running around the streets and having fun. I, for me, I think the turn came probably sometime during secondary school where I started to realize the seriousness of my, of my actions. So my actions could take me down run, one road or another. And I realized that when I was, uh, you know, I, wasn't, I was able to do quite well academically without trying. Um, oh, wow. So I was fortunate and I, it didn't actually occur to me until I got old enough to realize that. And I realized that they were always competing me with this other girl in my class who's now a lawyer. Um, oh, and wow. we, and I suddenly realized that I, I wasn't having to study and even she was studying very hard. And I knew because I used to ask her and I didn't have to do the same equivalent hard work to get to where I got to. And I thought this could all turn very badly if I don't put in the hard work, because your intelligence will only get you so far. It doesn't matter who you are. It yeah. doesn't matter who you are. It will only get you so far. You have to put in the hard yards at some point. And that turning point came when I realized I was on that crossroads and it was either start, you know, add the hard work to the intelligence um, or not. And, you know, end up working in the local well, our equivalent of Bunnings. This is in the UK, of course. Um, was that a local or private school? I, I went to a very, very meager, very poor government school. Wow. There was only a few of us that even went to university. From that school? From that school. It's a very, very, very simple school. Subhanallah. Subhanallah. Very simple school. And it goes to show you that you can make it to anywhere you want to get to. The school, the school helps. I send my kids to a private school, but, but you can make it wherever you want to from anywhere. If you really have the drive. Amen. 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 Yeah. 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 So, subhanAllah. So, so mid, mid secondary. I believe so. Yeah. It's about did, that time. Did you, did, was there sort of a light bulb moment that we had like, did you have any failures then? Or did you sort of start your grades start dropping because you weren't trying or how, how did it sort of come to you? 
the light bulb moment came when my science teacher, who, uh, God bless him, was an African gentleman with a, with a very thick African accent, loved him to bits though. And he took me aside one day and he goes, you will never make it. You will never be anything. And I said, you know, Mr. So-and-so, why? And he said, because you mess around in class too much and you're sitting there and playing with your friends and messing around and you'll never make it. I promise you, you'll never make it. Wow. And I think that moment for me hit me and I was like, he's probably right. Like if I sit there just spending my time, you know, making all the other kids laugh, um, you know, I, I'm not going to do very well in life. And so, and that was for me was the turning moment. And in fact, the second turning moment that really um, pushed me was when I applied, when I finally realized I wanted to do medical uh, school, I wanted to become a doctor. I applied to a medical school and eventually I got a rejection back and they said, oh, it's because you're, t when I inquired, they said, it's because your science teacher has said your projected grades are very poor, not enough to get in. So this wow. is even before I sat my exams. Wow. Your projected grades were very bad. And so I was very upset and I approached him and I said, how dare you, you, you know, you're compromising my life and whatever. And he goes, I told you this many, many years ago, you're messing around too much. You're not going to make anything of your life. So why should I give you good projected grades? So this was about a year or eight, almost a year before my final exams. You know, your final exams that you sit in so secondary school. Year 12. You, year, year 12, 12 exams, correct. Um, and so that for me then, that was the real light switch moment where I thought I've got a year to get myself in order. And I pushed and I pushed and I got the grades to get into university. Oh, wow. Well, so your year 11 was, wasn't as, as, no, as good as no, it should have oh been. Oh God, no, no. I was messing around so much. Um, wow. So I, year 11, year 12 is the, is I, I the was, catalyst. Yeah, I was... I was like most other young boys. I was um, enjoying the moment with my friends. Yeah. And you, you don't realize the consequences do, of that. We Absolutely, all do. of yeah, course. Yeah, yeah. Yeah. And, but you know. it's how we just need that moment, don't we? Like, I can reflect on myself. We can all reflect on that, that time when somebody put us aside or said yeah. something that really of course, hit hard. Yeah, and it's yeah. like. But those are the two moments. Those are the two finding, you know, founding moments for me and, and sort of that, that change. Um, the other thing, of course, to say is that change for me probably like was borderline, possibly even a fraction too late. So that the grades I made were just enough to get into medical school, Lower, right. but because they weren't strong enough, I actually didn't get into medical school. Wow. I had to do a science degree first. So when I finally got my grades, I, um, I ended up doing a science degree in Sheffield University. It's what we call a red brick university in the UK. So it's one of the old founding universities from the 1700s or 1800s. And uh, so it had a very good reputation. It was the fifth, the fifth best university in the whole of the UK and there's like 30 universities or something. So it, was, it had a high reputation. Anyway, I got in to do a science degree, Bachelor of Science in Neuroscience. SubhanAllah. And I tried to get into medical school a year after that and I, I, you know, they wouldn't let me in. And then I tried again at the end and I, I ended up doing a, a master's degree at the end of my science degree, a master's in neurology. And it was only after that master's degree that I got into medical school. But no, none of this was without a fight. Um, every single step for me was a challenge, a real challenge. Wow. So how, challenge. how many years of uni? I did nine years of university. Nine years after year 12? Yeah, nine years of university. Wow. Before wow. I became a junior, junior doctor, baby doctor. SubhanAllah. Yeah. So really, if you had, if you had uh, really concentrated on year 11. I should have been a doctor. I should have got into medical school straight after. After, you, after, year, 12. after year 12, correct. But maybe you wouldn't have, it's probably how Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala paves the way too, at the same time, maybe you wouldn't have got into neuro, I guess your field, isn't it, really, the neuro Yeah, so the, doing the neuroscience degree gave me the love for the nervous system. And I started to understand the complexities of it and also understand that we still don't understand a lot about the nervous system. <laughs> and so um, that realization for me was like, oh, wow, this is really, you know, this is like, you can't see, understand, and look at all this anatomy, physiology, and not believe in God. You couldn't, Love because the, the power of it, the more you sort of read into it, and the more you understand the complexity of how the nervous system works, you go, the only thing you can say is subhanAllah. Allah. It really is. The only word that explains it is subhanAllah. It's just baffling. So then I thought, well, I want to be a doctor. I love neuroscience. But I also loved using my hands. I was very good with my hands. So as a kid, I was the kind of guy that when dad's car used to break down, I would, oh, let me give it a go. I'll fix it, dad. Or, you know, the electric window stopped working. I'd rip the door open and try and fix the motor. So I was always good with my hands. Oh. So mixing the two together, it made sense. I wanted to do surgery. And then, of course, with the brain, 
brain, doing the brain surgery, the neurosurgery was uh, wow was the uh, was the only way to go. Subhanallah, Subhanallah. Yeah. So, so we, I think we want to show maybe a small piece of what you do. Yeah, on, yeah on this that. is uh, what we're looking at here is a video of uh, for those of you who are watching a video of me doing uh, complex brain surgery. So this is ultrasonic guided uh, brain lab guided. So that computer you can see in the background, the white screen with the the yellow around it is called a brain lab machine. It's worth about a million dollars. And the navigation system, which is, uh, sorry, the ultrasound system, which is worth about $300,000. And together the two of them integrate. And the idea is that you can take out brain tumors safely. You can update the roadmap of where you're going. Um, so you can take what looks like a grape sitting in the middle oh, of a jelly bowl, look at that. Uh, which is what a brain tumor is, and, um, and take it out safely without causing any harm to the surrounding tissue. And what you'll see shortly is, there's the brain tumor at the surface, and I can understand its distinct margins, not just based on what it looks like, but based on the computer navigation system that we use and the ultrasound no, system that we use. And here, what you're about to see is that very carefully, um, uh, using essentially micro instruments, we can take out brain tumors in its entirety, keeping the patient safe. And there's a tumor. Wow, right no, no, Akbar, man. So, uh, there where, you go. where do tumors come from? Uh, all sorts of places. So some tumors come from other parts of the body. So you can have like what's called, uh, you, well, you can have like a breast cancer or, you know, bowel cancer or lung cancer, and they can travel to the brain. So we call them metastases. Oh, wow. Or you can have brain tumors that grow from the brain itself. Primary tumors from the brain. So they just grow from the brain tissue or from the lining around the brain. SubhanAllah. So various, various places. SubhanAllah. Uh, there you go. Um, I know that you don't drink coffee because... I don't. Because <laughs> I offered him a coffee and he said, I don't. Gotta keep the steady hands. That's yeah? right. Indeed. SubhanAllah. Yeah. Allah. It's also because I'm British. And I, grew <laughs> drink up, tea. I grew up in an era where we drank, we drank tea. That's right. SubhanAllah. Yeah. Uh, that's beautiful. SubhanAllah. Uh, can you take us to like a moment in your sort of journey throughout your uh, you know, medical field, maybe where it got really tough and where things sort of fell apart, where you thought, oh, this was like really tough, tough time that can move forward, like even throughout your education, maybe, you know, what were, could you have that moment in time where you felt like? I actually I had, and I say subhanAllah, and I always say alhamdulillah for everything, of course, as a Muslim, but I actually had quite a lot of tough journeys along the way. I had multiple points and I'll just go through them very briefly, but it started at that point. I explained to you where I got invited to Oxford University. And for those of you that don't know, you know, that don't know Oxford University has a, an amazing reputation and I went there, I got interviewed, I got selected down to the final five to get into medical school and actually got selected into what's called Corpus Christi College, which is the most prestigious college in Oxford. And that was me, Lord. young guy from a, you know, really underprivileged school in North London, uh, getting accepted into Oxford University. It was a great privilege. And then of course I didn't make it because of these projected grades that my teacher did for, you know, so that was the first Wow. hurdle and ended up having to do the science degree tried to get into medical school after that they said no second hurdle said i had to do a science degree and at the end uh, i had to do a, a master's degree sorry at the end of my master's degree i'd done quite well so i'd got a high score for my bachelor of science i did really well through my research in my uh masters of philosophy which is what my uh, master's degree was and at the end of it they still wouldn't let me into medical school and oh. my um my mentor at the time during my master's degree was uh, a guy called Richard Grunwald. So he, um, he's, a, he's a chap who was very straight, you know, down the line. And I said, you know, prof, I got rejected again. They wouldn't even give me an interview for medical school. And he rang them up right in front of me and he said, is there, I'm looking at this guy's CV. He meets all the criteria. Is there any reason why you're not Getting him, you know, giving him an interview, apart from the fact that his name is Muhammad. That's wow. exact words. Lark. The next morning I got a call from the medical school saying, come for an interview. Wow. Um, literally the next morning. And, uh, and I went for the interview and of course, alhamdulillah, you know, I, I, I like to think I talk very well. So I excelled and, and they gave me the place in medical school. It was a, it was a huge moment in for me in my life. Huge. And I thought I'd overcome all the battles in the world. It was the world, everything, you know, it was like I was going to suddenly, you know, become my dream. I was going to become a doctor. I was going to become a surgeon. Alhamdulillah. But halfway through medical school, well, first of all, at the end of my first year of, of, uh, of being a, a doctor, so I've done the five years of medical school. There's lots of hurdles along the way, all lots of little hurdles. 
at the end, um, I got into doing an internship year. And at the end of the internship, you have to apply for your second year residency. And then they go by how good you were as an intern doctor as to what residency you get. So the most prestigious residencies, you know, programs were reserved for those who are very good. And you have to apply and show how good you are. And I was always fantastic with organization. And subhanAllah, it goes to show you Allah has a plan for everything. I missed the deadline. And I don't know why. I missed the deadline. So that I came to put my application and they said, oh no, that the closing date was a week ago. And I said, no, but I'm sure it was this week. And they said, no, it was a week ago. So I missed it. Wow. I said, you don't have a job in the UK. That's it. Doesn't matter how good, you know, they go, actually, you were one of the best on paper. We thought you were going to be the golden boy. And you didn't apply. So we just assumed you weren't interested. Wow. So, and so I sat, I went to a coffee shop. <laughs> this was in Sheffield. I remember going to a coffee shop and I was very, very, very upset with myself. Didn't know how I was going to tell my parents. And um, you forgot and, and there was to a apply. Girl, I forgot to apply. And it, it was unlike me, but it goes to show you, this was Allah's plan all along. Allah. Akbar. Sat at this coffee shop and there was a girl in my year, an English girl who came, called, her name was Andrea. And I sat with Andrea and she said, hey, what are you doing here? You look very upset. I said, look, I missed the deadline. I can't believe I did it. You know, where are you going to get your job? And she goes, actually, I'm not doing a job. She said, I'm going to Australia for a year. Australia, where's Australia? Why? <laughs> End of the world. <laughs> and do they even have hospitals there? You know, it's like, <laughs> Hello, what's Australia? And she said, no, no, I'm going. And she goes, oh, I'm going with my boyfriend. You know, the, she had a, a boyfriend and he was a, a doctor himself. He was actually training to be a heart surgeon. This guy is called Ben. We became friends. Anyway, she goes, come to Australia with me and Ben. Wow. And I said, well, okay, this is 2004. Anyway, she gave me the contact details for someone in Australia. Before I knew it, subhanAllah, the paperwork, everything just flew. I had this acceptance to come to Australia to work for a year. So I did. And um, I'd already met a guy called Ahmed Ali, uh, who's Walid Ali's brother, actually. Yeah, Ahmed, that's right. um, who's now become quite famous. But back then, um, you know, Walid and Ahmed were just two brothers I knew. And Ahmed was the senior doctor that I worked with when I was an intern in this intern year. Inshallah, beautiful brother. So then when I came, was coming to Australia, I rang him and I said, Ahmed, I'm coming to Australia. And he goes, oh, fantastic. You know, I said, I'm coming to a place called Melbourne. He goes, no, that's where I am. I'm in Melbourne. I said, okay, well, great. Hello, Akbar. So I turned up here. I worked here for a year in Australia. Ahmed looked after me, looked out for me. And then in this year, of course, I met my now wife. I met her at uh, the Broadmeadows Eid. No uh, way. Eid Festival. Eid Festival. No. Oh my what year was that? This was 2005. We were probably catering at that. We were there. <laughs> so I was standing at the ICV stand Love with Waleed God. and Susan, his wife, Susan Carlin. Wow. And my That's little right, sister. Part of ICV yeah, then. And uh, my little sister, who was a, a doctor at the time, she, oh, sure, she was training, she was in medical school. She was out from the UK with me. And wow. she said, Oh, who's that, who's that lovely girl over there? And Susan said, Oh, I know her. She's from the Albanian Islamic Society. I'll introduce you. They met. We met, Subhanallah. got married, and then we went back to the UK. This then takes me to my next challenge. So I got back to the UK after I got married here to an Australian girl. We've <laughs> known each other for six months. We did it the full halal way. So Allah, fully chaperoned coffees and dinners and met her family. And then we got married. Went back to the UK. And then they said, oh, no, you can't become a neurosurgeon. I said, why? They said, oh, because the rule is if you leave the country, you're off the radar. We... we we really don't want much to do with you, in, in essence. Wow. And I said, but how? But I'm British. And they said, oh, no, no, you've left the country now. So you, you go right at the bottom of the pile in terms of priority. Wow. So I applied for like a, a job in neurosurgery, but it's, right, it's basically the job they give to international people from subcontinent Asia um, to just come and fill a role in the hospital. So it's like a, it's a gap filler. Wow. So wow. Doctors who come from overseas who are non-training, not they just put them in these positions. Yes. And I applied for one of those roles. And I remember when I went for the interview, they gave me something even lower than that. They said, oh, there's a, there's a British trainee. We're going to give her the better role and you're going to get this other role. And I remember walking out of the interview, going back to the car and my mum was there, my wife at the time, you know, and I said, oh, they're offering me this really rubbish role. I'm just going to say no, and I'll just wait to see what happens. And my mum, uh, Allah Hamah, she's passed away now, but she said to me, take the job. I said, mum, it's really bad. She goes, take the job. Allah will lead you somewhere else. And I said, you know what? You're right, mum. And I took the job. So, 
And so I took this job and I was the lowest on the ladder in terms of priority. And there's all these other trainees and senior people and doctors and surgeons. This is at the Royal London Hospital Neurosurgical Department. And within three months, showing them what I could do. And alhamdulillah, I was doing really well. I was doing, oper- they, they were teaching me to do operations. And, you know, I, I clearly demonstrated my skills. And the most senior uh, doctor uh, came up to me and um, he said to me, do you want to be a neurosurgeon? Do you want to be a registrar? A registrar is like a seat in much, way more senior. Because it's like it's like a five step jump up from where I was. Hello. And I said, yeah, I'd love to be. And I thought he was joking. And the next morning we were in a meeting and I sat there and he walked in and he goes to the juniors, I'm sorry, you're all going to be down a, a junior. You will employ somebody else. But as of today, Mo is now uh, a registrar. And he just Hello. promoted me like that overnight. Hello. Wow. And uh, so that was the next hurdle that I'd overcome. How, so to, go, to go back to that, isn't that amazing how everybody knows the MVP. Everybody knows the most valuable player on the team. And and this is what's happening out there in our youth, is that they go in thinking they're getting the lowest end, but if they can elevate themselves through hard work and through effort to become the MVP, It'd be crazy. It gets paid. You you get paid at the end. You get it. You get the elevation. You get the instant. You can be a tenfold elevation. You know what I mean? So, you know, subhanAllah, I've been there. You know what I mean? So, you know, like, it's amazing when you're the MVP, they can't afford to lose you because you're doing amazing stuff. And it's like, Allahu Akbar. I think that's a really valid point. So sometimes, you know, I, I know a lot of people as well who will say, I'm not doing that job. That's beneath me. Well, I'm not doing that role. I don't want to do that role. That's that's a rubbish role. That's a crap role or whatever that, you know, the youth will say these days. But actually, and I almost had that same approach until my mother, who's an uneducated woman, completely uneducated woman, said to me, no, take that role. You never know where Allah will, he will mm. lead you in the right direction. Allah, and she was absolutely right. She was 100%. She knew better than any educated person at the time Allah, because she had that faith. But also that's absolutely right. That's the way the world works. You put yourself in a position and you show yourself, 100%. prove yourself, prove earn yourself. your position in the world, earn your position in where you think you should be, earn 100%. your right, 100%. but show yourself. Don't expect that overnight someone's going to come and hand it to you on a plate. They're not. 100%. They're not. You've got to Allah. prove your point. And yeah. subhanAllah, we've talked about this, that Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala is the most just. He, he will not give it to you if you're not deserving. A hundred percent. And that's an, also another key that people don't understand. How could he give it to you if you're not capable you have no capacity, you have no ability, even though you might think so. I worked really hard. In those three months, I remember I really made an effort. And actually, I made an effort, and Allah knows best, I made an effort for me and for the patients. I actually wasn't aiming. I didn't ever expect them to say, you know, this was going to happen. I was actually trying to get, I was, of course, trying to prove myself, but I thought it would happen over six months, a year, two years, you know. I thought it was going to be a long road. So I was actually doing it mostly for me, to prove that I can be good to the patients and do right by the patients. And also I wanted to learn to become a good surgeon, but in doing what I wanted to do and trying to achieve the goal I wanted to achieve, it showed. The proof was in the pudding. SubhanAllah. SubhanAllah. Love it. <clears throat> so, so from, from there, so how, how was your journey to Australia? Like how did that happen? Like? So then of course, once I became a registrar, then I applied for the training program. So this becomes the next hardship. So to become a, a surgeon in the UK, and it's the same in Australia, you've actually got to get onto a training program. You can't just do it by working as a hospital doctor. And so I, I applied for the training program, and the first year, and the, the program application is only once a year. This is for general surgery, neurosurgery, any kind of surgery. It's a once a year application. And I applied for neurosurgery, and they only take the first 35 people in for interview. And of those 35 people, they narrow it down again and again, and eventually they only six or seven or maybe 10 people get accepted to become neurosurgeons. You get put in a program and then they guide you through the next five or six years as a trainee. Wow. That's how it works. So the first year I applied, I didn't even make a look in. So I, I was like, they rank you and I was ranked number 36. And I think only the first 35 people got interviews. I was literally, I just missed out, but I basically didn't get a look in and I was so upset with myself. But again, did I give up? No. Carried on working, carried on proving myself, carried on doing what I do, just looked after my patients, learned to operate, continued to learn to operate. And I applied again the following year. And the following year, you know what I did? And I probably didn't do this the first time, is I went in there and I genuinely could say this hand on heart. And I said, you know what? It's Allah's will. I've shown, my, I've done my best. I will continue to do my best. 
if it's meant to be, inshallah it will happen. If it's not meant to be, then Allah doesn't want it for me. I'll do something else. I'll become a GP. And, 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 and you know, I was comfortable with that in my heart. I really was. And I went in there comfortable with that in my heart. I gave him my best shot in the interview, but I was really relaxed because I didn't, I wasn't nervous. I knew that it was whatever's meant to be is meant to be. And because I put my faith in Allah, the rankings came out that year. I was number one. I went from 36 to number one. Allah, wow. the first, I was the number wow. one ranking trainee on the interview list in the whole of the UK. Wow. So how you can jump from 36 to number one, I don't know. <laughs> but I remember then they offered me whatever training position I wanted. I said I wanted the London rotation because there was different rotations. You can have like Manchester or Sheffield or all these different mm. UK places. And I chose London, of course, because my family lived in London. And so I got onto the training program in London and did that for uh, five or six years. And then when I sat my exams, you have to do a fellowship. And the fellowship normally is somewhere overseas. And I was going to go to America. And um, my, um, my obviously my obligations are to Australia because my wife is Australian. And she, I think she was feeling homesick by this stage. She's been out of, the, uh, out of Australia for eight years. Allah, subhanAllah. And so I said, you know what? I'll do the fellowship in Australia. And initially I'd actually applied to Charlie Teo's fellowship in um, in Sydney, and for those of you that don't know, know, Charlie Teo has been in the media a lot recently for uh, lots of um, not so great um, um, actions, if you like. Um, so there's a lot, there's a lot of reports out there if you look up Charlie Teo. But anyway, he was he was actually known to be a good technical surgeon, and I came to operate with him. And I rang Ahmed Ali and said, "Hey, I'm coming back to Australia again, and you know, after all these years and." And I'm coming to work with this guy called Charlie Teo and he sort of went quiet and said, look, you know, there's a bit of a reputation there. Like he might be a great surgeon, just be careful. So then I changed my mind and ended up applying to the Royal Melbourne Hospital under a chap called Professor Andrew Kay. He accepted me straight away. And uh, 2014, January, we landed here and I moved into a little rental home in Truganina and there you go. Isn't that amazing that it's not only that, it's the connections that also guide us. And they're like, you know, subhanAllah, yeah, having Muhammad, Muhammad Ali here to just to give you those one sentence, say, hey, be, be careful. careful. Yeah, yeah, absolutely. It, yeah. Isn't that amazing how we need those connections to help us and guide us along the way? Of course. Yeah, senior, Ahmed is, uh, is older than me by 10 years. And, you know, my dad always taught me something when I was younger. He's, you know, he told me in Arabic or maybe even in a, specifically an Egyptian expression, but he says, um, there's an Egyptian expression that says, for those young people who don't have an elder, they buy one. Okay, it doesn't translate very well, but in Arabic, it, the, the, the essence of it means that like, it's so important to have an elder that if you don't have an elder, you, know, you don't have a father, an older brother, an uncle, an older friend, you almost have to buy one because it's so important to have that person in yeah, your yeah, life. Wow. So it's a great experience. And, and he taught me that. And so for me, having someone like Ahmed here, because I don't have an older brother, I have a younger brother, I'm, I'm the eldest brother. Um, having someone like Ahmed and more, you know, more knowledgeable people, people with more life experience, I will always respect and listen to that, always. Oh. And um, and I think that's something that, again, I would advise the youth of today to do, yes. is not always expect that you know everything. You might know a lot, you might have a lot of life experience, and that's fantastic, but never turn, a, you know, never turn away uh, the experience of somebody more senior who's been around the world a lot more um, you know, they might have something very good to say. Subhanallah, yeah. So that 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 whole aim, inshallah, was to come to Australia just for another four years? No, when we came in 2014, it was actually just to come for one year. It was only, I only had a job for one year. Okay. It was a one-year fellowship, and we decided, me and my wife, that we were going to see how that one year goes, and we were going to make a decision as to whether we stayed in Any Australia. Any kids then? Long. Any kids? We had two. Two. My oldest two were born in London. Oh, mashallah. And so we came here with two young kids, and like I say, we decided we were going to see if Australia was for us. Or whether we go back to the UK, because I'd already been promised a consultant job in a very prestigious hospital in London uh, called Charing Cross Hospital. And so I said, okay, we'll see how the year goes. And either we go back to Charing Cross and live in London for the rest of our lives, or we stay in Australia. And at the end of the year, again, I proved myself and they said, hey, we don't want you to go. We want you to stay. And I said, okay. They said, we don't even have a job for you, but we're going to create one for you. And so they created this role called spinal fellowship and i said hey i'm a brain surgeon i love doing but i hated doing spine surgery you know and for me it was all about the brains and and, I, and they said hey look just do spine for a little while it's just a way to get you in the door because we don't have an actual brain position for you 
So wow. just do it. Just just put your head down and just do it until we can get you the position you want. And you know, I have this philosophy that if you're going to do something, do it with passion. Actually, you know, own it, mm. live it, and own it. So then I said, you know what? I don't like spine surgery, but I'm going to own it. Love it. Over the next three to four years, I'd become a name in spine surgery. Now, alhamdulillah, I give lectures all around the world in spine surgery and how to do complex spine surgeries in fancy ways and using robots. And you know, I, I'm, Allah, so, Allah. I'm on the board of. Uh, directors for companies that are building spinal robots now and you know uh, it's it's crazy how the world can take you into these random places so now i do brain surgery and complex spine surgery even though that wasn't my thing but there you go so, uh, yeah. Allah. Yeah. Allah, yeah. Akbar, how allah guides us through so, so many absolutely, different absolutely allah akbar, but you've got to own it you have to yes. whatever what allah, whatever allah gives you own it yes. subhanallah wow. agree that's it's subhanallah we're just talking about that just that appreciation that this is what allah subhanahu wa ta'ala wants for you and like you're saying, giving that hundred percent, just giving it all you have, and let do your as we say, let, do your best and leave the rest. A hundred percent. Big believer in that. Yeah. Um, I would love for you to share, uh, like maybe if you can give us that that moment where you felt top of the world, like you're there, you got to what you wanted to. Would it would it be like we're talking about in your life where you just said, yeah. I'm, I've got it. I made that time. I'm successful this time and moment in my life. And of course, we have multiples in our life. But what would one that will stand out the most in your life? I'll tell you one that you'll, you'll probably find a little bit funny. Um, but for me, when I came to Australia for the fellowships, this is now the second time around, 2014. I'm already an established neurosurgeon in the UK. I've passed my exams there so I can work as a consultant neurosurgeon in the UK. But I came in to do that fellowship and they said, oh, we want you to stay for a year. Uh, I said, okay. And then we made a decision to actually stay for good. And they said, oh, no, no, but if you want to stay for good, you've got to sit the exams again. And two years of supervised practice, and you've got to go and do all these courses. And they really made life difficult for me. So the hardship never stopped. Hello. Oh, wow. Yeah, so this was 2015, 2016. And I had, to, I had to really jump through a lot of hoops here. And I could have just given up and gone back to the UK and got a consultant job tomorrow, but I didn't. I stayed here and I said, no. This is the life we want. And, you know, I'm not going to run away from the hard life or the hard, you know, hoops that Allah's asked me to jump through. So I worked hard. I had to study all over again, back to the libraries, back to everything else. Allahu I had, Akbar. you know, three kids at this point. Allahu Akbar. I'm uh, studying very hard. And eventually I passed the exam in 2019. And uh, I got a job. Uh, sorry, end of 2018, I believe. And beginning of 2019, I got my first consultant job in Australia Love that for me was the real like that's it I never have to sit an exam again I never have to do any hard you know I've, I've reached where I want to reach I can start actually doing the you know doing what I've been trained to do being a consultant surgeon and I remember that being one a big light bulb moment but I remember the second sort of very close light bulb moment was when I started earning money as a neurosurgeon I remember seeing the first twenty thousand dollars in my account I've never seen twenty thousand dollars in my account wow. isn't that amazing I've lived all my life I lived with just you know, what came in one hand went out the other. And alhamdulillah, I was happy with that as long as, you know, the bills were paid and I had money to put petrol in the car and, you know, my card wasn't rejected when I went into, you know, Coles. That was oh, all I wanted. Like, and so when I remember seeing the first $20,000, I remember my wife looks at my phone and we're looking and going, oh my God, we have $20,000. It was like a huge moment that suddenly, you know, all this hard work was beginning to pay off. $20,000. Oh, and that would make me the happiest man in the world. <laughs> and you know, honestly, I could have 20 million in my account now. I could still have that 20,000. It's the same happiness for me. So no different. I just needed to know that I was comfortable. $20,000 was what it was for me. That's it. I'm happy. <laughs> Subhanallah. Allah. 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 Isn't that amazing? Yeah. Yeah. Allah, uh, there's a few stories. With, mashallah, we've shared some beautiful stories together throughout time. Allah, but I think what a beautiful moment. The, the time we met. If you remember, like um, you came to Bergies and Hoppers. I did. That was the first time we met. That's right. Uh, and, uh, and I, came, I was just cleaning up the dining and I, I went remember. in there and uh, I asked you, I said, brother, so what do you do? And you go to me, ah, oh, just a doctor. And, Allah, <laughs> and then we had that chat and subhanAllah, we've, we've met through that time. You know, and that was That's what, right. SubhanAllah, that was a beautiful moment for myself, remembering and you know, meeting a beautiful brother. But uh, I remember we shared some stories and I remember the story you spoke about a, a gentleman that you met, you put me to tears. I'd love for you to share that story where that was an interesting one um so firstly i should say that was a beautiful moment when we first met my uh my recall of first meeting you was a big fancy 
sports car outside that I could never <laughs> afford. And I was like, I wonder if he's ever going to give me a ride in this fancy car. <laughs> um, but but I remember thinking, oh, this guy's very down to earth. And Marshall, I had a very, very beautiful uh, impression of you as well. But um, by going to the story, the story you're referring to is um, me being in clinic one day. So this is now as a consultant. This is very early on as a, as a junior consultant, but sort of 2019. And um, I called the next patient into the room. And it was an elderly gentleman in his 70s, Australian, you know, with a Caucasian name. And uh, his name is Paul. And he came in and um, he, he had arm pain from, from a pinched nerve in his neck. And of course, that's what we do, spinal surgery. But I said, look, hey, you're 75, you know, I'll just, we'll, I'll arrange for you to have an injection. We'll try and fix that arm pain. We'll keep you going for a bit longer until you can retire. You're 75, you're a builder surely you're going to retire anytime soon. So let's keep you going until then. And he turned around to me and he said, no, 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 I, I'm, I'm not going to retire. I said, okay, but you're 75. I mean, surely you're entitled to retire. And he said, oh, no, no, I can't stop working. I just can't stop working. And I said, oh, my dad was the same, you know, hard worker. He's always hard. He said, no, 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 I can't. I actually can't stop working. There are people relying on me. And I said, what do you mean? And I thought he, I assumed he meant his employees, you know, his company employees. And my next step, my next line was going to be just sell the company to somebody else. And, you know, <laughs> the employees can stay on. It's not really a hard thing to say. He said, no, there's, he said, there's, there's, I have lots of young children, orphans that rely on me. I said, well, what do you mean? He said, well, me and my wife, um, and he was very reluctant to give the information. I actually had to force this out of him. He said, look, um, me and my wife, we, we have, uh, we run two or three orphanages in Indonesia. And I said, like, Muslim Indonesia? He said, yeah, Indonesia. He said, we have two or three orphanages. And he goes, I I'm the sole person that provides for them. And I said, how was that even possible? And he gave me this very quick story, which is he married a Muslim woman. So he's converted. Um, and he married a Muslim woman. But he's Aussie as you like. Ocker Aussie, you know. <laughs> G'day, mate. You know? <laughs> so and uh, you'd never know. And he said, look, you know, I married a Muslim hijabi. And uh, he goes, you know, after we got married, we wanted to do something because we didn't have any children. So we, uh, she came up with the idea of that we'll look after orphans. And so we opened up these orphanages and now all these people get, you know, all these kids get dumped at the orphanages. So the orphanages grow. And wow. he goes, we tried to get help from the government. The government, you know, a couple of, you know, peanuts, they throw peanuts at them essentially. So he works hard as a builder to send money across to fund these orphans. Allah. Now that Allah. for me was, he had Islamic instincts. Now, this is a guy that I know he's Muslim by name, but he hasn't really converted. Like he, this is, this was just him. Yes, no. This is a guy with Islamic instincts. It was, it was, it stopped me for a while. It really stopped me in my tracks. You know, when you get that lump in your throat and, heart, no. and I was like, this guy is, is a Muslim, like by all intent and purpose. And he was raised clearly with these Islamic principles in his own natural heart. You know, Allah guides people, doesn't he? Amen. And because he was clearly a good man all the way through, Allah made him Amen. a Muslim, you see? Amen. Through marriage, he made him a Muslim. People don't see that, but you know, Allah will make him a Muslim because he was a, he was a good instinctual man. He goes, I can't leave. He used to say things, like, I can't leave these kids on the street. And he go, oh, I just had to send $4,000 across because one of the kids who's disabled needed an oper and actually a brain operation. No. He goes, I can't leave that kid to die. I can't, he goes, I can't, I'm human. That, that's a beautiful child, I've got to, So he sends all this money across to help these kids. And I said, I said, Paul, listen, <laughs> we, you know, <laughs> I think we can help you here. <laughs> so there's a big Muslim community, do you know any Muslims here? He goes, no, I don't really, you know. Allah. I said, we can help you here. So of course, as you know, as you know, we started to raise money and alhamdulillah, since then we've managed to buy money for three ambulances. So we bought three ambulances that transport the kids around. They call them ambulances. and. Um, we send a lot of money. The kids have got lots of food and we, we, we've now bought them things like mattresses. Allah so I went across there and these kids were sleeping on hard floors. Allah That's Allah. all they knew is hard floor. Like literally on the classroom floor, they just slept on the floor. And so, you know, for a thousand dollars, we can buy 33 or 34 mattresses. And it was Allah. like, you know, it was like Eid for them. Allah. Isn't that amazing? Like some and it's amazing how Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala sends us people like that in our life. For Absolutely. us to be able to give back or there be able no to be way, part of it. There was no way that that guy wasn't there for a reason. Allah. Allah. And only Allah knows that reason. Yeah, yeah, yeah. But we've got to, you've got to be able to act on it. You know, when Allah puts something in your path, you've got to be able to say, 
I can act on this as a Muslim. Mm. And I say that to everybody out there. Yeah, subhanAllah, same language. You know, some people say 5G, <laughs> some people make sure your receptors are on. But it's it's amazing how much that we touch people in our lives that Allah's sending for a reason. Absolutely. But some people, like you said, they're so engulfed in themselves, they're not realizing. They can't see the wood from the trees. Absolutely Allah. right. You've got to stop and say, Allah's put this in my path for a reason. Yeah, that story, he could have told that story to anybody else. He might not have even told me that story. Allah. And I forced that story out of him. I didn't need to. It wasn't even part of the history. It wasn't relevant to the medical examination. He was going to get the injection anyway. <laughs> but it's just like the way it happened, you know, there was a reason why Allah made him tell me that story. Allah. So when Allah puts things like that in your path, whoever you are, now I might not be the most financially, um, you know, viable person. I might not be a, a wealthy person. But even if I wasn't, Think about what I could have done. I could have yeah. gone to somebody else. Brothers, can we raise some money for these people? Can we do like a charity shop thing? Can we do whatever? What, just 100%. find a way to help. Everybody can find a way to help. Yeah, me and Everybody me. can. SubhanAllah. Allah always, SubhanAllah, I noticed like again through in our journey, always somebody will come and and give us some kind of perspective or some kind of opening that we never even thought of. And the, the hardest thing is to act upon it. It's just to go, you know what, I'm going to grab this by the horns, you know, and just keep going and mm -hmm. do the best we can. No, and this is, I think, the best advice we can give our youth. You know, this, that, like, even as a young child, we've missed out on some of these sometimes. You know what I mean? We, we miss out on these, like, you go, try that. And then you, you sort of, nah, nah, keep going. And so Allah puts so many things in our pathway. Yeah, and it's beautiful. Absolutely. It's beautiful, like, uh, listening to that, that pathway that you've had and all the different oh, You never want challenges. to regret things in life. You want to always, um, always take everything that Allah gives you and, and, and go with it. You know, really go with it. I mean, I mean, absolutely. Yeah, I mean, I mean, hundred percent, hundred percent. Oh, what a what a beautiful journey. Uh, maybe that. maybe you can maybe share um, another small moment in your life. Maybe uh, yeah, something that uh, maybe gave you joy through helping people, or something that really sort of uplifted you in helping people. Because I can only imagine. Like I can I can say he's helped me, and uh, alhamdulillah, I've got use of my hands and stuff like that. But maybe is there something in your life that you've sort of can yeah. share with our audience that you know maybe the change of somebody's life right. that's been amazing through your hard work and effort because subhanallah some of us um, don't see how much work it takes to get to a position of you know capacity and ability and subhanallah sometimes the fruit of that capacity is, is absolutely amazing and it's motivational and motivates us to want to do more so we can help more inshallah wallahi alhamdulillah um you know, by the grace of God, I've, you know, how can I put this? There, there are many moments like that, and I'm very fortunate. I'm very humbled and very fortunate by it, but there are many moments, um, and I couldn't pick one, you know. Love. I help a lot of Muslims, non-Muslims alike. You know, in medicine, there you, you, of course, you don't even think about backgrounds, religions, sexual orientation, even nothing. You just, it, we're all humans and we help everybody, but um, there was a couple of, there was a brother from... Uh, a mosque um, who had a brain tumor and had been given multiple advices about um, not having this operated on. So he had to live with this tumor and it was causing him a lot of pain, facial pain. Wow. A lot of facial pain. Um, and when he heard about me, he said, Oh, I may just get some advice from a Muslim brother. You know, and there's nothing wrong with that. I think everybody, every culture, every religion have their own comfort zones. There's nothing wrong with that. So I know a lot of Jewish patients that I know very, that come and see me eventually will usually go and see a Jewish doctor first because that's their comfort zone and that's okay. Yeah. Indian doctors will see Indian uh, uh, patients normally. A lot of Muslim patients come to me. It's just the comfort zone. Um, and so the brother came to me and said, hey, I've got this tumor. I've been told it's inoperable. And I looked at it and it was complex to say the least. Um, and I said, you know what? I think by the grace of Allah, I can take this out and I can probably get rid of your facial pain. And he was very reluctant and very scared, of course, given that two other people had said um, that it was inoperable. Wow. Eventually, we went ahead with it. He he put his faith in Allah and, of course, his faith in, in his faith in me. But he put his faith in Allah. We did the surgery. It took about three or four hours wow. and we got the tumor out. We didn't damage him and, he was, and the pain went away. Wow. And he now works... Uh, in somewhere in North Melbourne, and uh, <laughs> he lives a normal life, and he's very happy. Allah, uh, that's just one of the first two that comes to mind because I'm thinking of, you know, the relevance to the show in terms of maybe a Muslim young patient. But um, do you do you feel that barakah in your life that 
obviously, you know, the Hadith of Rasul Sallallahu Alaihi Wasallam, he says, you know, if you save one man or somebody, a human being in mankind. Like you save the whole humanity, humanity. Yeah. Do, 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 you, do you feel that in your, I, in your I life? I honestly have to, I, I do a lot of um, self-humbling uh, tasks. So I make sure I ground myself a lot. I, I will sometimes clean the operating theatre. Like I'll grab a mop and I'll clean the operating theatre. And all the nurses will run and go, no, 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 doctor, please, what are you doing? No, no, no. You know, respect. And they look at me like they're absolutely shocked. And I'll say, no, 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 please leave me be. And I'll clean the operating theatre just to keep myself humble. Um, I will walk around the streets of Melbourne very commonly in jogging bottoms and a T-shirt from Kmart. It doesn't bother me. It's like, I don't think about these things. Um so uh, it's very important that when Allah gives you a position of power or control or, a, you know, a skill or an ability, uh, an ability that people come to you for, you must keep yourself grounded. You've got, always got to say Alhamdulillah, Alhamdulillah and just do your job. Uh, I don't, that's why I don't, if you notice when people say, oh, you know, you're this and you're that, you're, 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 thank you. You're the best. I say, no, 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 I just turn it off and walk away because... <laughs> I don't want to hear like, you know, I just, I said, Alhamdulillah, you're well. That's all I need to know. That's okay. I'll, leave, I'll, I'll walk away. You know, I don't do praise and stuff like that. I just, you know, praises for Allah only, of course. Alhamdulillah. It's great to see. Subhanallah. Yeah, subhanallah, the stories are so unique. And you know some doctors, that you doc first. <laughs> you get to get subhanallah. Yeah. I, I try to do a lot of, um, you know, you, you, you spoke about um, Allah giving you stuff back for doing something. You know, there's a lot of doctors out there who will do medicine for the money because, of course, surgery pays a lot of money and surgeons do well financially, of course. But I never did surgery. For, I never did medicine at all for the money. In fact, you know, I never knew in my life I was going to come to Australia and doctors in the UK, senior doctors, your maximum salary is seven seven thousand pounds. That's it. Oh, wow. So, you know, you, you again, you can live a normal, comfortable life, but nothing extravagant. So I, it was never, money was never a thing for me. So I, um, I try to, I do a lot of work for, for free. I don't charge friends, colleagues, um, or even people that are struggling. I'll say, don't worry about it. You know, I won't charge people. But you know, it's amazing. Allah gives you that back. People forget that. Amen. Allah says to you, you give sadaqah, if you give it from your heart, he will give that back to you. It doesn't drop from your money. So yeah, I yeah. do, I do a lot of free stuff and then, Unlike a lot of my other colleagues, I just get all this extra work coming my way, and it's like, hey, where did that come from? Where did that come from? Where did that come from? And you got to go, hey, this is Allah giving back because I'm doing this other stuff, and you just go, alhamdulillah, and you just get on with it. You know, you don't, you know, Allah, you give, give in the way of Allah, Allah will give it back to you. Don't, never fear Amen. that. Amen. You've really, Amen. really got to believe that. Never fear that you take that $20 out of your pocket to give to somebody who needs it. Never fear that it's actually going to drop from your wealth. It's not. I mean, never the plates ever. Subhanallah. <clears throat> never ever. Allah. And what Allah. we're taking to the grave with us? Good yeah. deeds. Yeah, that's it. <laughs> that's that's, that's the only currency. It's a valid currency. I'm trying to maximize my currency. Here. <laughs> it's the only currency. <laughs> Everyone wants to buy Bitcoin and uh, Ethereum, <laughs> and I say to them, get the Hassanet up. I'm trying to maximize. Allah, you got to fill the Hassanet bucket. As we all are. As we all are. I mean, Subhanallah. Allah mm -hmm. mubarak ya Rabb. Just touching based on the story, when you first came to Australia, you were saying before off the mic uh, that you bought your first house. You, you were telling that beautiful story. Just if you don't mind sharing that story, that was an amazing story. Yeah, well, when I, I was explaining that um, when I first came to Australia, I came with nothing. I, you know, I, there were times in the UK where my poor wife would go shopping, and uh, I remember she called me once when I was at work. She said, "Hey." I'm at the shopping aisle, you know, I've got this big trolley and the card won't go through. Is there something wrong with the card? And of course I logged onto my app and there wasn't enough money in my bank account for her to, to buy the shopping. Allah. And I, I, I was just heartbroken because she had to leave it. And, you know, so Alhamdulillah, I always say Alhamdulillah, but you know, there were times where I struggled financially a lot, uh, even as a junior doctor, because like I say, you don't get paid very much. And London's a very expensive place to live. Yes. So when we finally made that move in 2014 to come here, uh, all the money I had was basically pretty much paid for the flights and just to get myself over here. So, you know, uh, I had tried to get together a couple of thousand dollars and bought a little car to run around in. And my father-in-law, um, yeah, Allah bless him, but he, um, he, he helped us sort of, you know, pay the first month's rent and stuff. And he basically rented a little place for us in Draganina. Oh, wow. Because that was like, you know, affordable range. So we had a nice little house. And I loved that place in Georgia. I loved it. It was great. 
had a double garage and I love that, you know. <laughs> I always wanted a double garage. <laughs> always. You know, the little things in life. In the UK, I couldn't have a double garage. Mm. So um, so we had this little place in Dragonina and then uh, I, I, you know, I just tried to sort of work hard and work hard through that first year. And then I realised that the travel time was a bit too much. So I wasn't in a position to buy um, but I rented a small, very small place, much smaller than the Dragonier place, but in North Fitzroy. So much closer to the Royal Melbourne Hospital where I was working. And um, I really wanted to be in a position to buy, but I was a long way away from that, a long way away from that. But subhanAllah, I'd kept saving and trying to save and doing extra work and doing extra hours as a doctor and trying to save and save. But again, just being a long way away. And then I was just like, oh, Allah, I'd love to buy a place. You know, you just sort of make these little diets, but you almost don't believe that they're going to happen. You know, how can it happen? You know, you, you, you're, you're, you're $100,000 short buying a house. You know, Allah, Allah's great, but, you know, you, you all, subhanAllah, stuff for Allah, you almost doubt yourself. You go, oh, but Allah's not going to give me 100 grand. And, uh, and sure enough, you know, you, just, you, ne you should never doubt the power of Allah. I, I got speaking to... Uh, one of my ex registrars, she was my senior doctor, she was much older than me. Uh, and we got talking, she's in the UK. And she said, Hey, how's it going out there, etc. She goes, You know, I worked out there many, many years ago, way before, you know, we knew each other. I said, Oh, really? She said, Yeah, I worked in Melbourne, actually. And she said, um, I saved a lot of money there. And I, I made a lot of money there. She goes, and I never brought it. I actually, it's still in my bank account in Australia. Now, why would she even tell me that? Like, oh, subhanAllah, no. this is Allah. And I just thought, Maybe Allah's trying to tell me something here. So <laughs> I just I just asked her straight out and I said, hey, listen, I'm, I'm trying to buy a house for me, my wife and my kids. And I know I'm going to be in a position to buy that house in two to three years, but I'd love to have it now. Oh, wow. Is there any chance I can borrow that money in your bank account if it's sitting there doing nothing anyway? And, um, <clears throat> excuse me, she, um, she said yes. Allah. She goes, you can have that money, no problem. Just give it to me whenever you're ready to give it to me. Wow. And I immediately, no security, her, nothing, nothing, no, no, nothing. <laughs> no signing your life away. <laughs> no, but she, um, Subhanallah. she obviously knew that Alhamdulillah that you know I was trustworthy. Well, oh, my name is Muhammad, which means trustworthy. <laughs> I don't know if you knew that, but <laughs> that's true. Um, Allah. But uh, she gave me the money, and uh, we bought our first house in Brunswick. We actually bought the house from a. Richmond football player. I can't even remember his name now. It's a guy with ginger hair. But anyway. SubhanAllah. Um, we bought it from a, a, a Richmond football player. And uh, yeah, that was our first home. Wow. It was... Uh, wow. It was Amazing story. Yeah. Can I just touch base <clears throat> from that pay package of 20000 in your account to where you were? How, how long of, of a gap was that? 20 years? 15 years? How, how much before you actually started seeing the money? I went to university in to do my first Bachelor of Science degree in 1995. 95. It was 2019 before I saw that first $20,000 in my account. The first time I ever seen $20,000 in my account. Wow. That's some patience. 2019 that's some, that's from some, 1995. That's some patience. Real patience. SubhanAllah. But, you know, you've got to have patience. It's, it's, that's it's, what our dean teaches us. The long term, isn't it? Yeah, Sometimes long -term. People, patience, have patience, come there in the end and enjoy the ride in the meantime. You know, people go, oh, you know, the youngsters, oh, Bitcoin or whatever, you know, I want to be a millionaire tomorrow. Work hard, enjoy the ride along the way. There's nothing wrong with the, yeah. the hard work along the way. There's nothing wrong with it. It's good. It gives you soul. It gives you, And it gives you the rewards along the way. Yeah, man, you don't know what rewards you're getting along the way. What rewards are you going to get sitting there on your mobile phone at home to yeah. your Bitcoin? Allah knows best, but... I can't imagine it's going to be as much as somebody running around doing stuff, help, helping an old lady walk across the street, whatever. Just getting out there and doing stuff, you know, you're getting your rewards. So yeah. The reason I ask that is because, journey. like you said, the youth just want it today. Yeah, They yeah. don't believe there's a struggle. They, they, they just see the surgeon and they say, I want to be that. And they don't understand the big all, struggle. All they can see is the destination. They can't focus on the journey. There's always a focal point, destination, destination. And, and there's so nothing wrong the with having a goal. Absolutely nothing wrong with that. And I encourage everyone to have a goal. Hey, I want to be, you know, I want to own my own business. Great. No problem. I want to be a rocket scientist. Great. No problem. But you've got to accept the hard work along the way. You have to. And you've got to own it. Like I said before, own that hard work, own that, that journey there. 
you know, um, do whatever it takes to get to where you want to get to. Work hard. I mean, within halal and within legal reasons, but, you know, do, do whatever it takes to get there. Work hard. Be passionate. You know, do a little bit of hustling. Again, as long as it's halal hustling, you can be a hustler. There's nothing wrong with that. But sitting down and just going, hey, it's going to come to me. It's not the right way. Even Islamically, it's not the right way. Morally, it's not the right way. I just want to touch base on another, when, just when you spoke about that you got accepted because your, your mentor called and said, What's, is it because his name's Muhammad? Take us through some stories that you, you might have felt that way and how you overcome them. Like you, your mentor actually spoke out for you. You might have felt that, Allahu Alam, I don't know. But your mentor might have spoke that. But how many times for your life have you felt that it might have been because your name was Muhammad and it might have been because your heritage being uh, Egyptian that, that you weren't weren't given the opportunities uh, that somebody else would have. Look, it happens. We all know it happens. We've all been through it. I've certainly been through it. Uh, I know a lot of my colleagues have been through it from all kind of ethnicities, all kind of backgrounds, all kind of religious backgrounds. What I say to that is, you know it's there. You know to expect it. Why create a drama around it? Just go, you've got to learn to just go, okay, I have to work that little bit harder. No problem. I'll prove myself. I'll show you who I am. Smile through it. When the, when the Prophet Sallallahu Alaihi Wasallam, our Prophet, oh, no, when he so went so. through hardships, did he sit in a corner and go, oh my God, I'm going to call HR? No, he didn't. <laughs> victim mentality. He didn't. He didn't. Yeah, you don't have the victim mentality. You just got to get up and just rise above it. He proved who he was by his actions. That's why people came to Islam. Amen. Because they watched him and they go, despite us, you know, treating him the way we're treating him, he maintained high moral standards and he maintained him as a, he, he kept himself, you know, the Amen. same person. He didn't change, didn't, didn't you know. Allah. And that's why people convert. And that's the same thing that I like to do through my life. I, I mean, I, I'm not anywhere near comparing myself to the Prophet Sallallahu Alaihi Wasallam, but we try to follow his footsteps. And so, Amen. you know, I smiled in everyone's face. I never, you know, I was always joking, laughing, and you know me well, you know, I like to crack a joke and I'm, you know, you know, that's what I do. I laugh and joke and smile. And I prove to people who I am. So even if they have those reservations inside, oh, you know, his name's Muhammad. Oh, he's Muslim. Oh, he's a brown guy. You know, whatever their <laughs> reservations may be, no problem. You come and spend some time with, you'll see who I am. SubhanAllah. And SubhanAllah, I got, I got that twice I've been in surgery with you. And SubhanAllah, all your staff, Masha Allah, Allahu Akbar. Every one of them said, we love working with Mo. We love working with Honestly, him. Such an amazing person. I'm not Allah just saying Allah. this. I say this only for the youth, not for any other reason, not, not, not being Allah. big headed or at all, but far from it. But just for the youth out there, Wallahi, the staff will come in when I need an operation for me and they'll reject everybody else. When it's out of hours and they're not obliged to come in. Allahu Akbar. And they have to ring them and go, hey, look, this guy wants to do an extra operation. And the nurses can say no, and they'll say, who's the surgeon? If they say, oh, it's Mo, that we're coming in. Just by your, your, your mannerisms, your actions, just by your good deeds, by your smile, just by treating people well, they will go out of their way to help you. It doesn't matter who you are. So don't, don't think that, you know, don't go for this, as you say, victim mentality. I think that's the wrong thing to do. Yeah, Allah, we, we had the same, same. Like yeah. we went into an industry where predominantly it was all Australian. We were the first uh, events caterers, Lebanese Muslim in, in the game. And, yeah, we, and and every time, like you said, every time we were put in, in those roadblocks and those speed humps, yeah. we uh, excelled. We became better. <laughs> like we, we went they, to they say the same thing as us. Why are you smiling? Why are you always happy? They all <laughs> want to know why we're happy. Absolutely. They put it, we went to the VA supercars and subhanAllah, the event was starting on Friday. We went there. And I went to set up early in the morning. They made me wait outside. They let everybody in. Yep. They let me in after the event started. And I still smiled and I still did my best. And we still, subhanAllah, Allah Akbar, Allah razakna. But subhanAllah, it's all about, you know what? It's okay. Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala hasn't got us up for me now. Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala is holding this back for a reason. And then, subhanAllah, when Allah opens the floodgates, Allahu Akbar, Allahu Akbar. Of course, Akbar. subhanAllah. <laughs> That's my advice to everybody. Don't, don't take this mentality of, oh, the world's against me, everyone's against me. Oh, the reason why I didn't get this job is because, you know, Joe Bloggs didn't want me to get the job because I look the way I look. Or could, no, just Never, 
Leave it in Allah's hands. Smile. Go, thank you. No problem. Try again. Try again. Keep Try going. Again. Keep going. That's it, mate. Be and the cream that rises Allah, to the top. Yeah, Allah will get you there in the end, you know? <laughs> I mean, I mean I if it's meant for you. It's meant for you. And, yeah. I, and I, like a lot of the youth, I say to them, they, they're all concentrating. I want, I want the money. I said, but, you know, out of all, or of all faiths, we, Muslims, we understand that our, our rizq is predestined. Of course, yeah. So, you know, if he's got written for you $10 million or $1 million, that's your test. Because this is amana. This is only amana. Absolutely, absolutely. I say to him, why are you stressing about that? Don't stress about the money. Stress about your growth. Yeah, that's right. Your, your path, your, your corridor problem. in life. Absolutely. That's the right thing to do. And you know what? I say to people, and, and people don't get this, and they say, oh, you know, it's easy for you to say that now because you've got money now. <laughs> but I did it for a long time. I lived most of my life without money. Most of my life without money. And you know what? How much money do you need? Hello. You've got you've got money in your account. You can buy food, Hello. no problem. Go and look at the guys in the streets in in, in yeah. Central Melbourne who sit in there with shelters over their heads. Go and Hello. look at them and then say that you don't have money. We've Amen. all got we, you've got you've got a roof over your head. You've got family who love you. You've got people who care for Amen. you. What more do you need? If you get money, look at it as a bonus. Alhamdulillah, thank you, Allah. Oh, you've given me some extra money this year. I can buy the rims of my car I want or whatever. You know, I can take that holiday. Great, fantastic. <laughs> But if you don't, alhamdulillah as well. Amen. Allah will bring you, you know, it'll come. Amen. Amen. Zakallah khair. Allah bless you. MashaAllah. SubhanAllah. You've left your, you left Traganina, drove all the way here for a couple of hours, still in your outfit, <laughs> coming here. Allah very fake. And may Allah bless you and your family. Allah, and Allah, and we, we absolutely love you. And thank you for sharing. And Allah, well, it was beautiful, so inspiring uh, to hear your story. And uh, it inspires me every time I speak to you. Alhamdulillah. Life. Allah bless you and your family and, and thank Amen. you Wallahi from the bottom of my heart all the hard work you're doing and all the support that you do within the community Amen. Amen. Uh, Jazakallah khair um, how could anybody help you uh, like even what you do even in the charity work and people reach out to you and say hey we want to help out in some of the charity work you do or anything like that well um, inshallah we're, we're, I'm in the process of setting up a formal charitable organisation with a charitable account tax deductible of course for those that want to give money tax deductible so once we do that you know, there'll be lots of uh, flyers out there and ways you can mm -hmm. help. You can volunteer your time or you can, of course, yeah, give money. Um, so, yeah, just all I say is, uh, inshallah, watch this space and, you know, I don't provide, you don't provide. Exactly. Like, Allah provides and, 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 and we, we and live in Allah's hands. Alhamdulillah, uh, Dr. Awad will be at the leadership retreat inshallah. Inshallah this year inshallah, in, uh, yeah. in July. Inshallah. So yeah. we, we're looking forward to having you there for the Three days. The pleasure of your So mind. we're currently very excited to have you there, inshallah. Likewise, likewise. Thank you very much. Thank you very much. Thank you for having me. Thank you. 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 Thank you